ever wanted to know how many possible ways there are to walk across a room? Well, I did, and I made an attempt to figure it out, and I liked it, so I did a video about it, and I figured out something very important by the end of it. As it currently stands, this is a pretty ill-defined problem. It is not mathematically rigorous at all, and it relies on several factors, such as the size of the room. If I want to rigorously define this, it would be best to start with a related, simpler problem. Let's say the room is made of many squares, and we are trying to figure out how many possible ways there are to get from this square to that one while only moving to adjacent squares. To prevent there being an infinite amount of solutions due to the ability to simply cycle between two squares forever, I decided to limit the moves to just right and up. Going left or down would be pretty counterproductive anyway. I will now attempt to figure out the amount of solutions to smaller rectangles, such as these. Notice that this is equivalent to finding the amount of ways to reach a specific square on the large rectangle. So there is only one way to reach the one here, which is done by moving right. The same thing with this one here. But this one has two possible solutions, this one and this one. Now, this one on the side also only has one possible solution. This is because going up would make it impossible to go back down. This also means all of these squares have only one solution. These two squares each have three solutions, and this one has six. Whoa, does this look familiar? Yep, it's the exact same as this triangle. You know, the one where every number is the sum of the two numbers above that also defines the coefficients of expanded exponentiated binomials. It has a few different names, but in the English-speaking world, it's usually called Pascal's Triangle. And we can fill out every single square by simply following Pascal's Triangle. We can see how this works by examining one of the squares. The only ways to get to this square are to be here and go right, or here and go up. So we will be adding all of the ways to get to this square with all of the ways to get to this square. This happens for every square. The only exceptions are these squares, but we have already figured out that all of them have only one solution. What does this mean? It means that the number of solutions can be easily found for any sized rectangle. All you need to do is create Pascal's triangle on the squares until you reach the other corner. And there we go. Now you might be asking yourself, okay, now how do we do that mathematically? And that's a good question to ask. This method only gives a general idea. In the next section, we will figure out how to do it more mathematically by creating a function with two inputs corresponding to the dimensions of the rectangle, which will output the number of solutions. We need to find a function that figures out how many possible combinations there are for any size grid. One way we can find the formula is by ignoring Pascal's triangle altogether and focusing on the grid problem. We might notice that for any room size n by k, we will need to go right n minus 1 times and up k minus 1 times. But the key is, it doesn't matter what order they go in at all, as long as we have the right amount. So we need to find the number of ways to arrange these instructions. To increase clarity, I have reassigned n and k to the amount of moves right and up respectively for now. I will revert it back to the dimensions of the room later. The first law has n plus k possibilities, then n plus k minus 1, then n plus k minus 2, until we get down to 1 for the last one. This means it's n plus k factorial, right? No, this is not the answer to our problem, since many arrangements of these instructions are exactly the same, just with the order of the same instructions swapped, which does not change it at all. Therefore, we need to figure out how many different ways there are to make any one permutation, and divide n plus k factorial by that number. You can rearrange every up instruction in k factorial ways, and every right instruction into n factorial ways. So every position can be made in n factorial times k factorial ways. We need to subtract 1 from n and k. So the final formula is n minus 1 plus k minus 1 factorial divided by n minus 1 factorial times k minus 1 factorial. Or we can simplify it to turn it into this. Here's a way to derive this from the binomial distribution formula. This one is useful for finding a number in Pascal's triangle as an n choose k format, but there's a problem. This formula accounts for n being this direction and k being this one, where rows are finite. However, this is not sufficient, since for a grid problem, we need one that works for this form of n choose k, where rows are infinite. Fortunately, it is possible to modify this formula to work with it. To do this, I will look at both triangles and see what it looks like when we have n and k at the same amount. If we keep k at 1, 
n means the same thing in both triangles, but notice that if we start to increase k, the only thing that changes in the second triangle is that n appears to go down a row every time k moves across. n just increases whenever k does. So this triangle's inputs are actually just the same as the other one, but instead of n, we have n plus k. This means we can just take the formula for the first triangle and substitute n plus k into n. We can then simplify it by removing the k minus k because it cancels out. Then we just subtract 1 from each n and k once again, and we get the same result. Now all we need to do is put this in a function, and we can find the number of ways to get from corner to corner of every grid. I will use um, l and w to denote the length and width of the room. Here's our function, just plug in the length and the width, and we can use the formula to find the number of ways to get from corner to corner of every rectangle. So for the previous example, we can confirm that it really is correct. Now this function works very well, but I quite enjoyed manually marking squares according to Pascal's triangle to figure out the answer. It was fun and intuitive and elegant, and it's the kind of thing I would want to apply to other problems. It could be fun. So for now, I will put the room question aside for a little bit and get a little sidetracked with grid problems. The first thing we could do to make a problem is simply add a thing such as a wall here, for example. This will prevent you from continuing the triangle in this direction, so the result will be different. This one can be traversed in this many different ways, but if you notice, this section is inaccessible, so we're basically just doing this shape instead. We can even do more complicated shapes, such as this one, or this one. For this one, I have allowed you to change your pool of directions when you reach this place. This is basically the same thing as putting two rectangles together, though. So to improve this one, I have added two different holes here, which makes things more interesting. Hey, how about this? We can have a hexagonal grid and allow these three directions, and we can still have it work with a finite number of solutions, although some solutions are faster than others. Oh look, a circular version. I don't know if there's a logical way to get this one to work, but I can certainly use my intuition to figure it out. Okay, it might be better if we start in the center and work our way outwards to the circumference, and now we have a better sense of direction when making our diagram, but honestly at this point I think I'm getting too sidetracked on these puzzles. I was trying to figure out how many ways there are to walk across a rectangular room, you know, the original problem that I said at the start of the video. Now I need to mathematically define the new problem, and I think I know how I'm going to do that. For the real room problem, involving finding the number of possible ways to walk from one door of a room to another, we're obviously going to need to create another function. Two of the inputs will be the length and width of the room once again, so I will reuse L and W. But then what? Well, it would be best if we did not have to account for things like body movement, the position on the z-axis, such as jumping, and the spinning of all the neutrinos. So to make it simple, the person walking across the room will be tracked by their center of mass, reducing their existence down to a dot. This turns this into a problem where we can move around in 2D space. Wait, if we did the exact same thing with this new puzzle and divided the room into squares, we could definitely adapt the problem from earlier into this more complex problem. There are a few problems, however. Firstly, the density of squares in the room is not specified, but for me at least, this density could be fully subjective, and I think it should have a place as an input in the function. What distance does a potential sequence need to be from a different one for it to be considered distinct from it? This is a necessary addition because otherwise we would be distinguishing solutions based on nanometer length differences. So the third input in the function will be squares per meter, or what size distance is enough for a walking pathway to be considered distinct from a different one. Secondly, for whatever density is chosen, the doors aren't going to be a single square wide. There will be a bunch of squares in it, and the person walking across the room could potentially start with any of the starting squares and finish on any of the ending squares. So the two new inputs will be D1 and D2, denoting the length of the two doors. In some rooms, such as this one, this part of the room is impossible to reach, and entering this part of the room it would make it impossible to reach the other door. Which means we could shorten our viewpoint to exclude those. There are multiple ways to do this, but I will redefine the width variable as vertical distance between the furthest ends of the two doors from each other. There's only one more input I want to add to the function. You see, a person cannot actually get their center of mass all the way to a wall, since a human's body has thickness. This means something like this route is not possible if the person is the size of this yellow circle, since then all of these yellow squares cannot be accessed by its center of mass. So we need another variable that determines the minimum distance the center can be from the wall of the room, to avoid counting impossible pathways. And here we have our function inputs. Now all we need to do is implement all of these into our grid formula from before, so we can calculate how many ways there are to walk across any room.
The crucial thing to notice in this new example is that, once you divide it into the right density of squares, all that's left is the use the function familiar, but on every possible rectangle, starting and ending on every permutation of start and end squares. This current function currently implements two of the inputs. We have four more to account for. Let's start with s for squares per meter. This one is simple. Since there are s squares per meter, we just multiply l and w by s. Next, we need to deal with the two doors, D1 and D2. Each door will be their respective variable wide in meters, so there will be s times their respective variable squares long. The important thing is that we need to find every solution for every distinct combination of starts and ends. I say distinct because, for example, these rectangles are the same, just translated vertically. The biggest rectangle has a width of w, and the smallest one has a width of uh, this. All we need to do is add together the this function for every number between w and that. We can do that by using summation notation. Here's the formula. It basically does what I just said. We have a variable, j, that goes from that to sw, and it adds together all possible variants of this operation for every value of j. Now all we need to implement is the t, or thickness variable. This one will effectively make both the doors and the rooms slightly smaller. There is a distance of t on both sides of this that are inaccessible, essentially making both l and w 2t smaller. We will have to multiply 2t by s to make it compatible with squares. This changes the formula to this. I have simply added minus 2st to each mention of l and w. We also need to do this for the doors, however the doors are only st shorter since one section has already been dealt with by the change we did to w so we only need to deal with one of the sides. This means we can just subtract 2st from the bottom of the sigma, then we can simplify this. Here is the final function to figure out how many ways there are to walk across a room. There's just one small problem. This formula is so ugly and inelegant, if we ignore the fact that it could probably be simplified by somebody who is better at mathematics than I am, it simply has too much going on in it, there are too many variables, and nobody would want to actually calculate this thing. And this allows me to see the issues with the actual problem itself. It was meant to be realistic with the doors and the thickness variables, but doesn't even allow you to go left, as well as the fact that the answer changes based on personal preference. S. I much preferred the original grid problem, because it was more robust and rigorous, it had a very simple and nice formula, elegant proofs of said formula, and even created the sidetrack journey from before. Not to mention that it can be useful for other problems, such as the amount of ways for a ball to fall through a pachinko machine, or finding the case number in the nth figure series. I don't like this room problem, which brings us to... Mathematical journeys like this can yield completely different results than what was originally expected. In this case, I expected to create a function for the room problem and be done with it, but the main outcome was this whole grid problem with all of its functions, derivations, and attached puzzles. The room problem turned out to just be the grid problem but with extra fluff, and the formula doesn't even work if the doors overlap each other. This isn't to say that the room problem wasn't fun to figure out, since it was, but the end result of it was suboptimal, and it proved to simply be an extension of the real outcome, the grid problem. It, along with its relationship with Pascal's triangle, its formula, and its many variations, proved to be very enjoyable and applicable. So the next time you're walking across a room, and you for some reason want to know how many ways you could have walked across that room, maybe try treating the room as a simple grid instead of worrying about all those other variables. It will make your calculation easier, just as long as you don't go backwards.